So I'd like to welcome you to our last lecture today. Um, as Kim Stalwood said um, in his lecture, uh, the most important thing uh, in animal rights as social movement is legislation and enforcing re legislation. So now I would like to introduce to um, a very famous activist who is actually focusing his efforts for many years now on uh, doing the most he can do for the legislation part in Austria. And he has actually amazing successes on his account. Uh, he was there uh, actually to make sure that the battery cages will be uh, forbidden in Austria and in Europe. Uh, he, the, he and other activists who cooper cooperated with him actually uh, make it happen that wild animals are no longer euros used in circuses in Austria uh, as well as the fur farming is banned. So uh, he is now a chairman of the Association Against Factory Farms, and uh, he used to be a philosopher, <laughs> and he used to be a physicist, but now he's just helping many organizations around the Europe to make it happen for them like he did in Austria. So let's welcome Martin Baluch <laughs> from Austria. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, nice introduction and thank you for having me here. I'm uh, very happy and interested in presenting experiences that I had and starting a dialogue on this, how we can proceed. Kim Stallwood had um, a number of remarks that was actually very similar to what I um, sort of would appeal to you um, with uh, coming from the experience that I had. Um, uh, my, I, I want to briefly lead you through the activism that actually led me towards animal rights. I started as a 13-year-old child um, to get involved in peace marches and especially against the nuclear uh, reactors in Austria. And that was very interesting for me. Obviously, I was just a side um, activist. I was just helping out. I was collecting signatures for this referendum. But this was a campaign. It was actually won. So there's something to learn for me and the early stages that you can win such campaigns. There is a ban since 1979 on building nuclear reactors in Austria, and it is still the case very much so today. But then came a decisive moment for me, and I was a student, um, political student, also in, in a student union, and um, the government wanted to build a new water power station. They said, we can't build nuclear power stations, so we build a water power station in the middle of a primeval forest to the east of Vienna. And we, as students, tried to organize um, protest against that. And eventually, we occupied this area with altogether 10,000 activists. Um, at one time, there were 7,000. Um, I stayed there for about one and a half months. and. We built little campsites in there, and it was sort of somehow the birth for many um, aspects of social movements in Austria, because we all came together. There was democracy in jeopardy. There was the ecological question. There were endangered species, as well as protection of individual animals. Until then, I was always interested in ecology, and as a side of that in animal issues. But there I learned that there were other people like me who were actually most interested in protecting the individual animal and not the species and not the ecosystem as such, but the individual animal and the ecosystem maybe for this um, individual animal. And um, from there also, um, it became a debate on why we do this actually. And we did then in 1985, I started a student group and we debated Peter Singer and we debated Tom Reagan. And I put these slides in now for similar reason as Kim Stallwood said, because I was on an effective altruism conference in Berlin just a month ago maybe, and it also worried me there how, how much there, uh, the, the how much is dependent on utilitarian arguments and how much is being said about an, a group is effective if it's from a utilitarian point of view, reducing the most amount of suffering with the least amount of energy. And I can only say this is not what I am about or what my activism is about. And I want to briefly with a few slides explain that to you because I find it a bit worrying to go down this road. 
Indeed, Peter Singer was um, celebrating his 70th birthday just a few weeks back in Vienna, giving a talk and also a public uh, uh, debate. And I questioned him there and, and others too on vivisection. Also, I'm not anti Peter Singer at all. I find he's a brilliant guy. I find his book worth reading. And I've, I, he, I cooperated with him in many aspects. He also joined our demo um, when he was there. But he did say there and then in front of everybody and university professors uh, who do vivisection, he said that certain experiments are justified if they minimize suffering. If the few animals that are used for this vivisection experiment, the suffering of them actually is outweighed by the um, protection of a huge number of other animals or humans who then won't suffer because of the results of this experiment. And I totally disagree with this. What if you are one of those animals that are being sacrificed for the others? Is it about minimizing suffering of the whole and don't care about the individual? I don't believe that at all. This is not fair, this is not justice, and what I'm about is I want to have um, a respect for every individual and justice. Indeed, in this um, primeval forest, there were wild boar who are living wild and free and autonomous and for me and self-determined. And these are the aspects that I find preservable. To be, um, to, to liberate those animals from human domination and let them self-determine what they do independently of if that reduces suffering or not. Because the, the autonomous decision of these beings is more deep going than the, than the suffering. The suffering is one decision, but you couldn't have the decision, I prefer suffering in some instances. So what you have to look for is the opinion of this animal and its free will to act and less the suffering. Um, there is a number of examples that I've put here. There was a big Austrian uh, trial, and in this trial there were state experts, and these state experts argued, for example, that liberating mink from a fur farm out of these cages is animal cruelty because, this professor said, Hacklender his name, he said that an animal in a cage, tiny cage, can't do anything there at all, but is being fed suffers less than if it's running wild. Because if it's running wild, it's constantly looking for, um, for a an, an bird of prey or an enemy that is going to attack it, and it's, uh, he or she is um, looking for food, and this is stress, and this is suffering. So in the cage, is less suffering than outside. Um, similar, this other uh, professor, he argued for, um, in, was a case of liberated pigs, and they were actually doing fine. They were out in the meadows from a factory farm condition, and they, they had water, and they had enough food, and it wasn't cold. But still, this professor argued this is um, animal cruelty to liberate those pigs from factory farming conditions because inside they have all they need. They have their food, it's warm, they have always water, they know each other so there's no stress amongst them. And so this is, from the point of view of suffering, this is better. And here you see, I totally disagree. Even if you argue this, and they argue that with measuring some blood level of suffering and, and um, anxiety and whatnot. And I argue what is more important is that this animal can decide. If I open the cage and this animal goes out and runs around, and this is a decision that I have to respect, obviously this animal wants to leave the conditions that it is in, he or she is in. So I respect the decision of the animal and not my um, imagination of, of the amount of suffering. Similarly, I have many examples. One of them is this uh, very gruesome in my I believe this is what they call animal welfare indicators. The, state, the government of Austria suddenly had this brilliant idea. This is a broiler shed, a typical Austrian broiler shed, and had this brilliant idea that they can increase the number of broilers in there because the stocking density maximum in Austria is smaller than the EU. Um, so they wanted to um, increase it to the EU level, and they say, until um, we, we can check if the animals suffer by looking at their feet, if they, they cut these feet off after the animals are dead, and then if the feet have only tiny wounds, you can put in more animals because they don't really suffer. If, if there's med medium wounds, then the stocking density stays the same, and if the wounds are very big, then you reduce the, the stocking density. So don't count uh, millimeters or kilograms, is what they argued. Just look at the real suffering, and then we, we do an animal welfare indication um, system. Again, um, 
I find that really grotesque. And similarly, the EU vivisection guideline um, says that death without suffering is less damaged than a prick of a needle. So the death in itself, and this is also a utilitarian argument, doesn't count really because nobody's suffering. As long as this animal, if it's humanely killed, as long as the animal is still alive, nobody has any damage. When the animal is dead, there is nobody left who can have damage. So death is of no consequence. So, but what is wrong with cages and with high stock intensities and with painless death? So for me, my decision is clear. I want to risk something. I want to live life. I want to climb rock faces. And I had once this situation where a big rock, big not a rock of that size, fell while I was climbing onto my shoulder, broke everything. I was stuck in this rock face. The blood was pouring out. I had um, this little... Um, the, the bones sticking out, I couldn't move it, and I had to fight to get out of this rock face and stay alive. And if somebody tells me, see, you shouldn't climb, um, we should have prevented it, that would have prevented your suffering, then I say, bugger off. I want to risk that, and I, f and I want to suffer in that situation. I rather want to suffer and have a free life than somebody telling me what to do because they think, seem, think they know better what suffering is um, and, and how important that is for me. Just climbing rock faces, sleeping in the snow. Um, I was in an avalanche as well, and I, I, I met this bear once at 10 p.m., this bear turned up in front of my tent. Luckily, my little dog friend was there, who then stood in front of him and barked at him, and he left. But um, again, somebody might argue, remove the bears, and they actually did do. I am in debates with hunters, and they say, remove the bears, then there's less suffering, because um, the bears don't eat somebody, the bears don't threaten humans, and I say, I want to live in a world where there are bears, even if they eat me, and if they kill me. I'd rather have that than live in a, in a world without them. And in my, in my um, life, together with my dog friend, who is down here, um, I found that these creatures, like him, are very much capable of knowing what is best for them in their surroundings and if they, if they know what they're doing. Indeed, out there, when we are going for weeks in the wilderness, never meet a human person, then um, we are quite on an equal, foot, an equal level in deciding where we go, where we sleep, what we do. And I realize he is an autonomous being, and he wants to do this, and he wants to decide by himself. So I um, appeal for letting him do this. Now, if I show this picture to these professors, Strokes and Hacklender, and they start measuring his, his anxiety levels in the blood, they will say, this is animal cruelty. I go with him through a, a, a blizzard, and this was indeed minus 18 degrees. He's a bit of short hair, and I was freezing too. And, and this is where we ran about. This is a whiteout. Is this animal suffering? Can I subject him to that? Well, ask him. After this walk, he wouldn't go into the car because he didn't want to leave. He wants to stay there, and he wants to experience these things. And he wants to sleep out in the snow with me. He wants to be out in the wilderness free and not on a chain. You could say, to prevent suffering, we just extend the chain. If this animal is going and then the freedom of movement is stopped by the chain, just make the chain longer. But there's a principal difference if you have no chain. The, the self-awareness of this animal makes a huge difference. A, a being that knows I'm chained, I am caught, I am I'm stuck there, is very different, never mind how long the chain is. So what I'm, I'm arguing, um, just cut the chain, take the chain. Our aim must be the chain must go and not extend the chain so that um, there is less suffering. So liberation is my aim. Uh, liberation of um, non-human animals from human domination, never mind the suffering which comes then. Sure, the domination causes suffering to some extent and often, and this is sort of a side, uh, this is sort of a derivative from this. But it's not my basic problem. My basic problem is human dominance, and if we get rid of that, then I'm happy. The tool is to establish animal rights, so animal liberation is the primary thing. Then comes animal rights, so the real right for life and liberty and, um, and um, uh, then a body that hasn't been harmed as basic rights in society, similarly to human rights, um, in order to protect them from humans. And then the method um, in, uh, to, to, to make 
the topic of animal rights a political topic, not a private topic, not about being nice and good and things, but a, a political topic, so that society as such, the system as such changes. But that doesn't mean for me I'm against measures of extending a chain. I would see a measure of extending a chain as a step towards cutting the chain. So I'm not arguing you shouldn't do welfare measures. I'm arguing you should do those welfare measures that lead you the fastest possible to a complete cut of the chain and liberation. A brief recount of my activities then. I uh, came to England in 1989 and joined the anti-hunting campaign. And there were a number of uh, gruesome actions like um, Mike Hill, he was killed on the 9th February 1991. And I was actually present when this activist Tom Warby was killed on the 3rd of April 1993. And it did something to me, obviously. If you see that happening and if you see how the, um, the state system fails you completely. Because in that context, what happened was that we had 40 activists as witnesses. And we trusted the state and we went to court and gave our witness statements. And the murderer was just left off, let off the hook. He was completely found not guilty. It was found this was an accidental death. And it was very clearly not. It was very clearly not. So, um, yeah, one, one tiny look in this direction that becomes eventually for me a very decisive thing. Um, the, the, the state and the rights and the justice system, they are basically being formed for um, the rich, for those who are the, the pillars of society against those who, who try to remove the pillars or who try to steal property or try to do something out of the ordinary. This is what the justice system is for. And it is, it is much harder to use it, actually, to the opposite when the powerful abuse the weak. And um, if you see that, then you realize that the, the power that comes from us is sympathy of the public, is the public supporting us. The justice system will fail you if the public doesn't support you. Another of these tragic deaths was in the 1995 campaign against life animal transports of Chill Phipps on the 1st of February 1995. And um, what followed was a number of pressure campaigns, of which I was partly part of in England. Many of them might be known. This is this Consort Beagle campaign, the Hillgrove Cat, which all looked very successful, Shamrock Farms, Regal Rabbits, and eventually the Shack campaign that we heard of. But the consequence was um, dramatic. There was a draconian police reaction. There were laws put up in place. There was no public sympathizing with the activists, but rather with the animal abusers. And um, you might tell me different, maybe somebody's here who knows better, but in my feeling, there's that the movement in England in the 2000s was really destroyed. There's, as compared to when I was there, there's almost nothing happening now. And there's very little, very little activity due to this um, repression by the state and due to the um, the, the mistake that was made by not caring about how the media perceives you and how the public perceives you. Instead, it was all what they called grassroots campaign, abolitionist, no compromise, no talking, um, <clears throat> and um, just direct pressure on the animal abusers until they stop. This is basically the idea behind it. On the other hand, were these national organizations, and these organizations did what we call media stunts, scandalization of uh, things that happened, but with not a political but rather private attitude to it. So not challenging the status quo of animals, but rather saying do it humanely. You, you must do it nicely, what's ever happening. So there are these two lines, the grassroots abolitionist and the national um, sort of very mildly mainstream welfareist that, um, that went their own ways, sometimes battling, but generally not cooperating. And um, it was then, in the late 90s, that we in Austria decided to try to have a paradigm shift and actually combine those two, have a synthesis of the national organizations and their power and influence, and the grassroots with their power and influence. And um, at the same time, have this aim of liberation in your view, but approaching it via reforms or via confrontational um, campaigns that do an incremental change um, of reforms until the abolition is actually happening. I thought uh, that I wanna, want to tell you a bit um, what I mean. 
for example, we have here a society and we have a scandal that suddenly shows how badly these animals are being treated in a slaughterhouse. And what happens is that a number of people now will um, change their mind and say we want to turn vegetarian or vegan. These might be these little crosses here. So what happens is though that they are all isolated people who are still in their social surroundings of people who don't care as much about animals and have just the mainstream meat consumption. So what happens is that they will essentially be sucked up again by society and disappear because humans are social animals. They like to do what everybody else does and less um, follow some principles. But now, if we have what I call supportive structures in society, then these, um, we'll talk about what that might be. But for example, um, be the group, a society that is um, known publicly, um, so that you can contact them if, you are, um, being, if, if your awareness is being raised. So again, there is this scandal in a slaughterhouse, people turn vegetarian, but now some of them might be close to these, um, to these supportive structures and they can attach. They can come to this group and say, oh, I've seen that, have you seen it too? Yes, we've seen it. And suddenly you have a human contact, you have a social surroundings that you can contact to, and then what what happens is they don't disappear, but they actually strengthen those structures and um, become members, say, or become even activists and support it. And um, <clears throat> what are those supporting structures? Everything that makes it possible for a person, a general a person, member of the general public, to actually see and experience there are others like me when they change their mind to become vegetarian or vegan or have an attitude change towards animals per se. This could be just organizations that are present in the internet. It could be Facebook groups or internet groups if you want, but it could be radio programs. Um, um, I run an animal rights radio since 1999, every week an hour, for that purpose, so that people who just tune in see there's somebody else who has the same problem, feels the same like me, and they feel strengthened and attached and don't just drop um, their, their activism. But it can also be, if you are doing it in what you normally do as a hobby, just have a sub group there of people who, who help each other um, in this. And how I want to <clears throat> sort of explain that best is with this, with this um, strange structure. Look at this, at this figure here, this graph. Um, on the left here, we have um, complete animal abuse. There is animal torture for fun, animal fights. So there's complete negligence of animals, no respect. And on the other hand, we have complete respect for animals, basic basically what I call liberation, or rights within society, or veganism. And um, society is structured in some way um, uh, in, within this continuum, from complete usage to complete respect. And um, all humans in society are like this bowl here rolling in the middle, and we consider it to be in gravity. So what that, what that means is, if you are doing animal fights, and this, this curve is society today, if you are up there doing animal fights, like dog fighting, this is illegal and is socially unacceptable. So if you do that, you always have to look over your shoulder and see if, um, if uh, you, you, um, your surroundings realize what you're doing, or if police is coming. So this is stressful, and you feel isolated a bit. You don't feel part of society. So it's, it's stressful and it's hard on your psyche. So basically it pushes you down here. And if you let go, if you just go with the, with the flow, then you will stop doing this. And then you end up here in this trough. Trough is factory farmed conditions, vivisection as a factory farmed product, I mean, or vivisection. This is what everybody else does. The easiest thing, the thing with the least amount of energy. If you just let go and go with the flow, you end up down here in this trough. That means you grab the, whatever it is, um, animal product that is in the shelves in your eyesight, the cheapest thing, like everybody else, the factory farmed conditions. If you then choose, though, to be more respectful towards animals and go to organic meat or free-range eggs, then you have to push hard this curve up. This is why it's so steep at the beginning, because um, the first step is the hardest. If you look for organic meat, then you immediately become alien to your group. Say you're going with your buddies to watch a football game, and then you come out afterwards, and there is a sausage stall, and everybody eats their sausage, and you say no. And they say, why? And I, it's not organic. And I say, not organic. Um, 
So obviously, it's hard to do this. So either you say, I'm not hungry, or I have a headache, or something, so that I can't participate. But that works on you. You know, you feel strange. Why am I so strange? Why, don't, why, this, why can't I be like everybody else? How easy it is to fall back down into the trough and do what everybody else does. And if you then go a step further, vegetarianism or veganism, it's even higher up, but the, the changes is not so steep. This is why it's not so steep. But generally, our problem, if you do vegan outreach only, if we go to people and say just become vegan is a good argument, you may, might persuade some people, but they have a hard time because they have to swim against the flow. They have to sit up there and be constantly bombarded by media, by normal people, who, who give them the perception that they are totally abnormal. Now, the supporting structures might be little dents in this curve. They help you a bit, you know. It's lifted up there are vegetarianism, if there is a vegetarian group, or if there is easy vegetarian options, and there is an animal rights radio, it all helps you a bit, it makes a dent, and you're sitting up there in this dent. But the dent is only a dent, it's not the deepest trough. So a bigger event in your, wo in your um, life, like your partner is leaving you, you're losing your job, you suddenly switch your priorities. You can't afford more energy to something else. And what happens is blah, 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 you go down into the trough and end up down here again. And this is why I feel, after I have to say um, almost 30 years of doing it, that um, vegan outreach has its limits. You can get people to become aware, but to change the whole society to turn vegan is a very hard thing to do. You must lift them all up. Um, you have pioneering people, maybe 5 to 10 percent, who are willing to live against the flow. But this is it. This is, the, this is the lid. There is no more that you can achieve. In principle, you could argue, if you just lift enough, lift enough people up in the dent, the dent will go down, and eventually you have the trough here, and this goes up. It might be a theoretical option, but I can't see it happening in reality. So what, what I am trying to persuade you to do, and what I see so little happening in, um, in the animal rights movement internationally is, yes, it is in, it's good to get people um, up there and to get um, people aware of the situation of animals, but there's one decisive thing to do, and that is switch, shifting, shifting this um, trough, shifting the system, grabbing the system and pushing the trough over there. Then you don't have to persuade everybody because people are social beings, they just fall in the trough down here and there and there, and eventually the trough might be at the vegan end, and then everybody's vegan, and you don't even have to have persuaded them beforehand, or they ha didn't have to be pioneers um, to begin with. What do I mean, for example? I'll show you a few slides of this as well, but um, we did a campaign, it was mentioned, um, to get a ban on wild animal circuses. And this we achieved in 2002, and it became active in 2005, and it was a six-year-long campaign, but um, eventually these circuses were banned, and then German Circus Krone brought it to the European courts, and there was a constitutional court case as well, so lots of trouble, but it survived the storm, this ban, and yeah, it was the first ban of that kind in the world. And before that, people just went to the wild animal circus, because everybody else went, because the children said, let's go there, and they said, yes, yeah, sure, and let's do it. And I saw them, I was demonstrating outside these circuses all the time. Just, just normal people who didn't really care either way much. They just did what, what you do. On a weekend, you go to this animal circus if it's in town. And suddenly, we switched the trough over there. And you can now only go to circuses where there are domestic animals, like dogs and pigs and um, llamas are considered domestic. Um, so there's much fewer animals at the circus, incomparable, yeah, incomparable. There's almost none left, some are, but almost none. And so the trough is far further here to the right. And what happens is that everybody goes in this circus and nobody goes, um, uh, the, the, the wild animal circus is up there. You would have to go abroad. If you wanna, I wanna see lions jumping through fire rings, then you have to travel a few hundred kilometers and change currency and then go somewhere and see it. Nobody does that. People aren't interested in that. They actually want to do what everybody else does. And so if you move the trough, you don't persuade the people necessarily, but everybody else does it. And at the end, very soon, you saw the attitude in society change. There were um, radio programs that said, how can these animal people take this traditional circus of tigers jumping through burning um, <clears throat> loops.
And then two months after the ban, almost the same radio program says, we have done banned that because um, it's an anachronistic tradition. How can you be so uncivilized to do this sort of thing? So um, the attitude changes in society. Now children grow up with being told and seeing lions are not animals that you put in a circus and let jump around. And so they, they feel this is of old times. This is nothing to do with us. This is, we are beyond that. We as a society don't do this sort of thing. And they're becoming sort of proud of it even. So this happens when you change the, the thing. And imagine we have to persuade everybody to not go in a wild animal circus. There might be some who do it, but I'm sure we would be still standing outside the circus leafleting. Could you please not go in a circus? No, but the children want to look. They cry otherwise. It would have been forever, you know. Legislation did it. 90% of people were never asked. They just followed anyway. So um, legislation is powerful. And you can change the system. With changing the system, you change whole society and also their minds, actually. The problem is um, humans are social and not rational animals coming with good rational arguments, persuades a few, and they might be important. These might be people who then spread it and are multipliers. But as a whole, general society is not listening to rational arguments, in my experience. But there's also this important foot in the door principle that they are more likely, changes are more likely if the change has already happened. Um, <clears throat> so small changes and not demanding a ban outright or nothing at all, because then you will, we would also be still be sitting here waiting for anything to do to change. Um, important is to understand, from my experience, maybe the Eurogroup has different ones, I tried to ask that, but my experience is politicians do not want to listen or change anything if there is no trouble in society, if there's no conflict. Why? They want to be re-elected, they have no ethical stance. The Green Party politicians, sorry, the Green Party politicians have no ethical stance. Um, either when they're in power. This is my experience. And we have Green Party politicians in power. We almost had a president, a Green Party president, but the elections is repeated on the 2nd of October. We'll see. But um, in power, suddenly things change. Why? Because there is the lobby of the industrial complex, the animal complex around them, who constantly pushes them, and they're scared of them because they're powerful. They can withdraw uh, subsidies, and they can withdraw um, uh, payments to the state, and they, they have influence on all levels. So the, the, the system pressurizes them to allow animal industries to do what they want. And why should they change it? Just because a friendly face is coming and saying, please do. If they're not scared of you, they won't change anything. So essentially, my experience is you have to threaten them. You have to threaten them by saying, OK, I will step on your toe until you do this. I will tell the public. I will sit outside your office. I will protest, and I will make the public aware, and you will be not reelected. Then they will listen, if they believe you. So you have to prove that basically with, an, with the campaign. But this is why I say a smiling, friendly, vegan outreach face is something to get the balls up there in this little side trough, but not to change society. To change society, you have to step toes and push them on and raise a conflict. Uh, Frederick Douglass said that as a campaigner in the 19th century in, in the USA uh, against slavery. He said, no change without conflict. Martin Luther King said it and raised conflicts, and Mahatma Gandhi e either. These are examples of people who tried to change a society within democracy. And their experience is, like my experience, that without conflict, there is no change. With a happy, smiling face, you don't change the system, you don't change society. <clears throat> so what we need is a confrontational campaign, and this is not sort of nasty or violence, maybe in Kim Stallwood's sense, because confrontations can be constructive too. The, the, uh, the idea of a democracy that is alive is that there is constant confrontation. It must be a confrontation that is not destructive. It must be with following certain rules. I wrote a book about this, The Resistance Within, within Democracy. And um, you can very clearly say what is a legitimate kind of activity and what is not. The important aspect is that you don't create an enemy that hates you to the guts, because then you will never have a compromise at the end. But you must hurt them so much that they are willing to go come to a compromise, sit down and talk with you. If I go to any politician with an, with, with, um, an idea of change, then they will generally not meet, meet with me. But if I'm protesting and the public is writing to them and the media is reporting, 
reporting, there is a problem. Why don't, why don't politicians do something? Then they will meet me. So they, don't, they might internally consider me as an awful and to, to be removed, which they also try to do maybe. But they're willing to talk about it and they're willing to find a compromise. And this is what a confrontation campaign is aiming to. Um, briefly to our group that we have tried to form on these basis, um, we founded in 1992 running these campaigns, the circus campaign. Um, today we have 22,000 paying members. Um, we just reached the second year running, a one million yearly budget. I hear very <laughs> similar to Mahi, but um, in ages much longer. <laughs> Um, surely, uh, if you're confrontational, and um, this is also perceived by the public, they see you as radical and confrontational, even if your ideas aren't. But if you're standing and going on people's nerves, then it's less likely that you get membership. This is just a bargain you have. So you, if, you, if you think about tactics and think about how to run the whole campaign, then you have to weigh between a friendly face that gives you a membership and support, and the confrontational phase that loses your support, even if the majority of people um, are behind you there. This is just also an experience that we have. At the moment, 29 employees in some offices, we have a huge amount of workload, 950 demos across um, the country per year, and 150 actions and 40 events, maybe. OK, um, <clears throat> but I want to show you a few examples of the campaigns we did. This uh, campaign started out um, by having to find these fur farms at all, because there was no law governing them whatsoever in Austria in the early 90s. And eventually, these were found, and then um, our disruptional um, activities began. But it, it took us till uh, 1997, the end of 1997, that we actually had this paradigm shift. And we actually suddenly thought, no. We are not going to just protest all the time. We are going to do this legislation and change the law. Um, I can sit on the roof of these fur farms forever. Why should they just close it down for that reason? They sell it and maybe abroad or wherever. So we need a law. So eventually, we tried that. And the last action was on the 10th of February, 1998. We occupied the office of um, the, the governor of this province where these fur farms were, were uh, stuck. After five hours, he talked to me. And eventually, seven days later, he agreed to a ban. And um, this ban came into force on the 30th of November, 1998, um, and which closed down all fur farms that existed in Austria. And there were, in the mid-90s, 43 fur farms, so not very few, but uh, also not very big. But this fur farmer here, who was the very last one in Austria, he then switched to Czech Republic and became the biggest fur farm there. So the problem has just switched over the border, which shows that animal activism is an international issue. It doesn't help to clear your country of fur farms. It must be everywhere until they have to move to another planet. And um, <clears throat> so it turned out to be reasonably easy to do this, which obviously had 10 years of campaigning before. But the moment we decided to have a legislative effort to the moment when it was achieved was less than half a year. A bit similar in the campaign against animal circuses. In 1996, we um, investigated those circuses, filmed them training animals, and uh, put cameras up there, and you could see them beating the elephants. And eventually, we published this film and started with demonstrations. But we had this English idea of confrontational demos, which just stood outside and protested and protested and protested. And the, we were attacked, severely attacked. Often, I personally was 12 times hospitalized by these people. This is our, um, this is our um, solicitor who got, we had him there to sort of see the demo and be a witness, and he got broken nose and punched in the face as well. So um, <clears throat> very different. But in 2002, we got a ban on the wild animal circuses, which took effect in 2005. And then no demos anymore. So uh, the circuses sort of disappeared, and we had a huge workload less. And it was then that we decided to try a big campaign, to do a big change. Um, until then, it was reasonably easy. And maybe that is something that can be learned in other countries, that the first law changes are reasonably easy. The enemy is not organized. They don't expect you to be so powerful as you are by raising public awareness. And they, they react very disorganized. They don't know how to react. And um, 
We caught them out in this campaign as well. But after this campaign, and maybe some following ones, it, it suddenly turned much e harder. Today, for us, it's much harder to have a legislative change because all animal industry complex aspects have their own lobby group who just immediately kickstart when they see we do a campaign and do a counter campaign. And they have much more money and they're very well organized, especially the vivisection ones, but also, also um, other pig factories. And there's also ag gag laws. They have three come in Austria already, so the powerful strike back, and it is becoming much harder to actually advance. But I show you this example because it was the first big success and because it was really a an, an, um, legislative change campaign um, par excellence. Um, in 1994, we sort of had no, not uh, yet the idea of really banning it. I can remember, I think in the late 90s, I still said, I won't um, see the day uh, when battery farming is banned. I will be dead before that because this is just so ingrained. 99% of eggs is battery farming. So there's no change possible. And then it turned out to be much, much faster. Um, what we did is we went with little ultraviolet lamps into the supermarkets and, and shined, shined it on these, um, um, on these eggs. And you see then the, the um, traces of the cage. And with this idea, we went to the supermarkets and they agreed that they would let us do it. And we founded this control institute that is still running. And, and we could sort of get all the cage eggs um, that were wrongly marked as free range out of the supermarket. So we established trust um, in the consumer that it is possible and that you really buy a free range egg. The second problem was peak trimming because it was said, um, and then it was true, that in a battery cage, the chickens are so close that you don't need to uh, trim their peaks. But if you give them free range access, then they peck each other to death. So it's anti animal to actually get the, the chicken out of the cage. We, in 2001, we did a scientific study. We funded it with 40,000 euro. And um, they came up with a result. This is still downloadable from our website. And it says, um, and it reduced the beak trimming to nothing, really. Because they don't actually want to. This is an expensive thing to do if they don't need to. And it turned out to be reasonably easy to do this. The consequence was there was no beak trimming, and the path was free to start, um, to start a campaign for a ban. And our attitude then was, and I still think this is a good idea, is that you, we did a big splashy action at the beginning so that everybody knew there is a campaign now. And that moment when that happened, stages, further stages of the campaign sort of um, increased, the esca escalate the, the conflict ever more. And this first action was a open liberation, but in a different style, as Claudio told us, because I went in there with a journalist and I admitted to it. And I said which place it was. And um, <clears throat> this was in 2003. And indeed, I was prosecuted. And um, the, the state prosecutor phoned me and said, if you pay 15 euro, then you will not be prosecuted. And I said, I don't want that. I want to be prosecuted. So I, I came to court, and I was found guilty of theft and burglary. And then I appealed, and then I appeal I found, was found not guilty, because by then, our campaign was raising so much awareness in the public that they actually saw my action as ethically just and in the, in the eyes of the public um, defendable. So they used the clause that was quickly removed after that from the criminal law code that said, in such a case, the person should be found not guilty. Um, <clears throat> And then we did this big investigation. I believe this was for the first time that somebody did that as a group. We went into 48 battery farms, which made up 40% of the battery farms. Then you see them here as little flags um, on the website. We then presented, and you can click on the flag, and then it sees the, you see the conditions there. So we basically wanted to have an overview of what um, battery hens face in Austria. Um, because usually, you, you, if you show the pictures of in a legislative campaign, you show the pictures of a bad battery farm, then they say it's just a black sheep. There's just somebody who doesn't do it right. But all the other battery farms are brilliant. So we need to have a, a high a statistics to actually argue. And then we went public with this. We sort of um, went into a press conference. We admitted to it. There was a lot of civil law suits against me and the others of us, and some we lost also, but never mind. Um, we also did more open liberations, and 
Uh, interestingly, the farmers all waited, or the state prosecutors waited for the first trial, and when I was found not guilty, all the others were dropped as well. So I was never actually convicted. And then, in the end of 2003, this idea came up amongst the, um, uh, amongst the battery farm industry to have an enriched cage instead of the conventional cage. This was... Um, um, they, they, in Austria, they said, this is the system that we need. The enriched cage, it's a cage like before, but it has a little mat here to scratch. It has a little um, a metal bar to sit on, and it has little plastic things hanging from the top to, to pretend to be a nest. In reality, it was a, a farm like all the others. And the government wanted to produce that in public, and we had uh, leaked information that this is going to happen. So we went into this uh, farm beforehand and showed the public of what it really looks like. And um, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that is not a battery farm, according to um, the farming industry. Um, this is the uh, yeah, a ban on battery cages, looks like this. Um, <clears throat> and so um, we could sort of take the pressure out of them, and they couldn't present that as, a, as an alternative. But it was still in the pipeline for the bill. The bill of the law was to say conventional cage is banned and rich cage is allowed. So we said it's now high time for a hardcore confrontational campaign. We started that in January, and it lasted only five months. But during these months, we did what we do when we, when we really sort of call for action. And this is we stand outside every day and do demos every day outside the officials' offices um, to remind them what the public wants. At the same time, we do media stunts across the country. Here were um, hens from the battery farm, dead hens presented, as well as the eggs from the um, uh, rubbish bins of the supermarkets and the male chicks from the, uh, from the breeders. But... Um, in order to show the public. But um, the moment we start this campaign, our idea is that we have to increase the pressure all the time. If you let go with the pressure, then the politicians will say, look, I have survived it. I don't need to change anything. It needs to escalate all the time. And they must feel or think that if they don't act, next month it will be even hotter, the climate. So we, you shouldn't never let go in this situation. Um, we also did an opinion poll in February, which showed that 86% of the population want the ban, which proves, in my view, again, this figure that I showed you at the beginning, because 86% want the ban, but 80% bought the same things. So this, um, the ball was in the trough, buying a battery cage, but the mind was up there on the, on the organic or free-range hen um, um, part of the track. But the social pressure obviously pushed them down there. And I can understand it. One can understand it. You don't have to be mad to actually want free range eggs, but buy battery cages. Because who of us here does that? We all want human rights, but lots of us will buy sweatshop t shirts or uh, palm oil. You know, if it's so easy and if it's everywhere and you feel you don't do it, it still happens, then you, still, then you start doing it. So you need to change the system, not the people. Um, eventually then, um, since the government didn't want to react, we started to escalate the campaign further, and there were two provincial elections and one um, um, federal election of a president, and um, we went to the election rallies, and this is something that heats it up really. If you, we went to the conservative party who was in charge, and their election rallies and just started screaming, um, the, if you vote for them, you vote for animal abuse, you vote for battery farms. And they soon reacted by um, uh, buying a security, whatever group that was there all the time, the anti-animal security, who was just chasing us wherever we were and pushing us around and trying to give us a hard time. But that, again, escalated the conflict. And this is not a bad thing. It's a good thing for us because um, the media become interested in the conflict between humans. And they're much more likely to report on this than on animal abuse. How often can you show the picture of a battery farm until the public says, OK, we've seen it? So, but if there is a conflict, if they shout at each other, if there is a security chasing animal people, and if somebody punches somebody else in the face because of battery farms, this is worth reporting for media who have zero interest in animals. And, but still, this hypes up the whole case. We had then these typical demos where you, when there's red traffic light, you put the banner on top of it, and then people go along and put out leaflets so that you put pressure on the, on the 
um, people do who want to be elected. And this was one of the one of the highlights. Then this guy was the agricultural spokespersons of the conservatives in the southernmost province. And I had a rally, and he had a rally, just 200 meters apart. I had a rally against him, he had a rally for him. And, um, and I was louder, <laughs> so he, he, he felt he was, um, he was um, bothered. So he got down from his stage where he just held his speech to his electorate, and he ran over to my stage, came up and punched me in the face. This guy's two meters three, <laughs> And he, he punched me. I still have the scar here because it ripped the skin and I started bleeding. You know, and um, the reaction is not hitting back. The reaction is writing a press release. The, the consequence was that, um, and the next day there were elections and the headline was um, the, the, the person to be elected, a cultural spokesperson from the conservatives, punches animal person in the face. They lost 50% of the vote in this election. And this is something that hurts, you know. Then they start listening. And there can be as many battery farming people around them who say, if you stop battery farming, we will, pff, whatever. They start listening to you because they don't want to lose 50% of the votes. You must be more trouble than your opponent. Then they start listening to you. He actually was not convicted, but paid, uh, apologized and paid 700 euros damages in front of the court eventually. But you can read that in the Wikipedia of his. That's good. <laughs> Um, there was the, uh, the provincial elections in Salzburg. There was this guy who was considered himself like an emperor, um, so a person that is so well loved by society. He, went, he walked around and waved like this, and everybody was supposed to cheer. And we, we built this coffin and walked behind him and said, if you vote for him, you might as well bury animal protection. And he got really pissed off at this, and eventually he lost his seat, so the governor became another person. So the second elections that they lost, here you, we see... Um, you see us following him. Um, this was the time when all the parties then um, invoked um, spokespersons, and these are spokespersons of all the parliamentary parties who suddenly were willing, were willing to talk about all these things. And then, um, <coughs> further more demos and public talks later, we had also an occupation of uh, governor's office with the largest number of these battery farms. We had um, occupation of the headquarters of the Conservative Party. We uh, upside down, we blockaded the entrance and some people climbed up on this balcony and stayed there for 13 hours. Um, <clears throat> we also went into the regional parliament. You can see me here shouting um, at them. And this is, um, it says, cage keeping uh, animals, uh, hands in cages is animal abuse. So obviously also not something that they particularly like. Um, lots of actions of this kind, all in four months. We went on in the battery farm in the city of Salzburg. 50 people of us, we occupied the roof, we broke through the window, took 34 hens out and put them out in the, in the green grass and then waited for the, waited, you see here the claws, they grow around the cage so that they can't actually move their claws away from, from the place where they are sitting after a while if they can't scratch anywhere. Um, we waited for the owner to come who was just down the street but she didn't. Um, Instead, the media were here. Police drove by and left. And then um, we went with the TV camera to the owner and knocked on the door, and she opened. And I said, we've just broken through your window and taken 34 hands. And she slammed the door shut and shouted, keep them. This is how big the pressure was on them already, that, they, um, that she felt if she charges that or does a trial, she will lose. <clears throat> so we had 34 chickens. Um, and then, um, this is in Parliament, this is the spokesperson of the Conservative Party, she wanted to present this super enriched cage farm as an alternative. We had by then 10,000 signatures against it and the pictures of the other, and with television, um, with me, I could challenge her just before her talk in the plenary meeting and show the pictures to the public. And so this whole idea was gone. Um, <clears throat> the, the opposition parties here, the Labour and the Greens, they actually realized that we are becoming an electoral um, uh, argument or change to the election and um, started cooperating and started giving us a lot of information. This is also a consequence. If you have this high profile confrontational campaign, then the enemies of your enemy suddenly become come feeding you in some way or other. So there was a lot of meetings with them and cooperation. We also went with every one of them to a free range farm to show them how that is and the public was there. We had um, uh, in the press conferences and also 
um, we had, um, <clears throat> this is the agricultural minister and me on the right, and the, the battery farmer with 400,000 battery hens here, and they had to debate with me um, in front of a um, news magazine. So um, eventually, on the 27th of May, we had this success. Suddenly, they caved in, the, and the presidential elections, the, the president candidate of the conservatives said in her last press conference, as the first point, I'm in favor of banning battery farms. So they really caved in. And um, soon later, on the 27th of May, there was this anonymous vote. Here, I sat on the balcony, and they all stood up, Every single member of parliament voted to ban enriched cages. And the funny thing is that if you look down the right, there's one seat missing. This is the head of the farmers' union. And since uh, due to the party whip, he had to vote in favor of the ban, he rather left and went to the toilet so that he could say to his farmer buddies, I didn't vote for it. <laughs> but anyway, in that way it was banned. It was um, agreed that till 2009 there is a phase out period. And then all battery farms had to be gone enriched or not. Um, and um, <clears throat> this is another consequence of this kind of campaign. Today, these um, phase-out periods are 25 years um, due to the far stronger resistance by animal industries. Um, also, when the doors opened, we could demand suddenly a lot more things. And we could demand an animal solicitor scheme, which is in existence till today. And also, they agreed in the sa same vote to put animal protection in the Constitution, which eventually only happened in 2012. But anyway, it was decided then because the doors opened. And this is the prime minister then. And the prime minister gave a speech saying, we always wanted to ban battery farms. <laughs> And now we do it. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, beside him on the right is the agricultural minister. He also said that. I was sitting in the balcony. He waved up to me and said, thanks to VGD, we're banning this now. And you think they're really nice buddies, aren't they? But and in reality, at that time already, he started to um, organize a special police squad that was set on us. And for the next years, followed us and put two spies, police spies, into our group. And eventually raided our place and put me in prison for 105 days under the um, suspicion proposed that I am organizing a criminal organization coercing political parties or companies. Um, we also managed to get the cage eggs out of the supermarket, which was reasonably easy when we said it's banned, it should go out, otherwise they're all foreign eggs, and imagine people eating foreign eggs. So um, the supermarket said, no, we don't want that. Um, so now it's 35% free range, 65% barn eggs, um, and 20% imported. This is down from 35% before the ban. So even the industry couldn't argue. This is some pictures that show you that we are far from finished. This is a barn production, which is a factory farm like before. But the hens have twice as, twice as much space. The hens have uh, real nests, and the hens can scratch on the floor. So it is a difference for them. But for me, I don't count the suffering that is um, less in there. But what I count, which is also an argument, obviously, I'm happy if these creatures suffer less. But what counts for me is the political change, the political. Suddenly, uh, hens have a political value. You can't do this and that with them. And this is, for me, um, what drove me to do that. But this also free range can look like this as well, one has to say. Um, and this is the, where these hens can go out. And these hens can fly, so they can actually fly and leave the farm. They can fly easily over this fence. They can walk into the forest. So this could be free range as well. Um, <clears throat> I have uh, very little time left, I see. So I jump um, to the last um, conclusions, basically. Uh, there's a bit more to save. Um, firstly, the, if you... If you want to change a system, you have four hurdles. The first is winning the minds of the public. Secondly, getting the government to enact the law. And then thirdly, to enforce it. And this is hard. If you have a ban, it doesn't mean it works at all. What we had was um, the ban on, on the wild animals and circuses, and they just continued. We followed them and always reported them to police. And the police said, OK, here is the fine. And before they could hand it to them, they were in the next district. And then the police said, oh, sorry. We don't know where they are, and this is not my district. And so we kept on them until we got it. This is the farm with these 400,000 battery hens of this farmer that you saw. He also just kept his farm running. He stuck up the finger to this law. So we had to occupy it and then sit there, and uh, eventually these battery farms were removed. 
Yeah, and then you always have to su uh, succeed in the constitutional court because invariably these people will go to the constitutional court and say this is unconstitutional to force us. Animals are our property and I have the right to do with my property what I like. And so you have to win this court. In the case of the battery farm, it was again this battery farmer who actually went to the constitutional court, but he lost. The constitutional court argued that it is <coughs> just to force him to uh, remove the cages, but had we forced him to be free range, for example, or stop farming altogether, then the constitutional court might have lifted this ban or removed it, because it is too harsh a condition on him. This is always what they're weighing, the balance between how restricting is the new law and uh, how important is it for uh, the public at large. And this balance must be correct. So you need to persuade the public and need to have the sympathy, otherwise, even in that last stage, you won't survive this hurdle. We then got a ban on songbird trapping. We had then a field day, had a ban on great ape experiments, and then, um, thanks to you, a ban on caging rabbits for meat production within 10 months from knowing nothing about it and being told by him what it is, to a complete ban. And I can show you the pictures, um, how that looked like. This is a farm, how it looked like before. And this is a picture of his, how it looks in Spain, I think. And this is how the same farm looks like now. And again, from a, personal, from a point of view of these rabbits, it's obviously much nicer. But for me, the important thing is that this is a, a political change. And uh, rabbits are not animals that you can keep like that. They are animals that must be at least respected to the amount that they are afford, uh, afforded this kind of keeping. And this is a success, again, that went through the whole legislation. You didn't have to persuade single people to stop eating caged rabbits because they would never would, but you, can, you could stop them doing this. So um, my time's running out briefly. After this success, the last one was the rabbit one. We had already all the spies amongst our group. Um, they did a big raid on us. They put a gun on my head, pulled me out of the bed, pulled me in a, put me in a prison and kept me there for 105 days. Um, they removed all our equipment and they put us on trial for 14 months, but we were found not guilty because we had learned our lesson. This confrontational campaigns in England, there was no sympathy of the public, just being um, aggressive and forceful. And this, we were trying to get the public with us. And um, I jump now a lot of slides to get to this last one, genau. Here, um, in reality, this is a, an important lesson. The last slide I want to show you. Um, if you increase the radicality of your action, um, then generally, this shows this figure, the effectiveness of the action increases. Um, this is because it causes more trouble, and the more trouble, the easier it will be to win this case because the politicians hate trouble. And that is okay until a tipping point, when suddenly this plunges down here and the effectiveness, effectiveness, effectiveness becomes zero. And that's um, um, because the public doesn't, um, doesn't sympathize anymore. So with less sympathy of the public for your issue, this drop-off point is much earlier. With more sympathy of the public, the drop-off point is much later. So you need to increase the sympathy of the public so that you can be more radical in your actions so that you have the most effect. Because you see on the right, the effectiveness is getting much bigger. Um, basically, you have here the mainstream activity where you agree with everybody and you have a smiling face, and this is nice and non-radical, but non-effective. Then you have the very radical effective action that is um, goes the largest effect just before the tipping point, and then it becomes totally ineffective and destructive for you even, because when you lose the sympathy of the public, then you might end up in prison, even if you haven't broken the law, because as I tried to explain at the beginning, my experience is, and I have been on trial at least 100 times, um, and <clears throat> these days in our campaign, about 30 times a year, I'm on trial in some way or other. And um, this is a kind of way that they fight back, the so-called SLAP, strategic lawsuits against public participation. And um, so I can tell you that the justice system drops you completely if there's no sympathy of the public, never mind what the law says. This is actually not um, an issue. Um, <clears throat> if I could... Yes, uh, just a few pictures of our campaign now. This is a pheasant and um, hunting of, um, of animals in enclosures that are being bred for it. We've been doing this now for exactly a year. In July 2015, we started doing this. 
And we have already the first successes. There are some, um, some laws have come in. In Vienna, a complete ban. This is a provincial issue. And in, um, in Styria, there is a ban, almost a good, good reform, but not uh, the whole way. Um, it's also a lot of confrontation with hunters, obviously, and attacks by hunters here, or um, security chasing you around. Um, <clears throat> essentially, um, we are hopefully closing this issue in the next few months that um, we should be there. So event this is the summary. Um, last slide. Um, I argue for a political change for non-human animals um, in the manner of a confrontational reformist campaign, so of a realistic reformist goal that is achieved by confrontation and raising, uh, raising and escalating a conflict. Um, the idea is to move the trough in this system, in this picture of the system, is a bit to the right, a bit to more respect towards animals. The means are democratic, legitimate, non-violent direct action, but um, illegal, um, but not violence, no threat of violence, no um, damage to property as means of this activity. And the idea is to drive your opponent so far until they are ready to settle in a compromise, and then you have a new system and a new trough um, move to the right, with the danger that um, this uh, animal rights trial, the constant slaps, violence of the opposition, you saw the pictures of the circus thugs attacking us. And <clears throat> also important, therefore, to try to uphold human rights and civil liberties in uh, cooperation with other social justice movements that um, have the same uh, needs for, for a free space to run such kind of campaigns. Okay, thank you. That's what I wanted to say. I'm happy to hear some questions. Okay, so we have time now for questions. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I um, I believe in in your work, but just playing devil's advocate, what is your standard like two sentence reply to somebody who would say, who would ask you like how do you get from these welfare reforms to liberation? Um, what is your standard? Shall I repeat? I'm sort of in, the in the future, you mean? Or no, right? Yeah, I, I mean, you know abolitionists and all these people that would say like these reforms don't help us they are leading us away from uh, liberation okay. what is your standard reply to that uh, how do we get there oh, yeah. um. <laughs> here it is okay I have to do it up there because it's not um. I can show you if I go to, I, I happened to be here for a while, um, a while ago, I mean, and gave a talk where I showed this slide, which I skipped now in order to be able to say something about liberation. And um, so I can show you this slide. This is the answer, the answer to all questions. Um, here, the continuum is you have arbitrary use of animals, then you um, ban the indirect, so you do an indirect protection, you ban things that are upsetting humans, not for the animals, then the direct minimal protection, don't beat your animals too much, then a relevant protection of economically irrelevant animals, this might be the circus ban, then a relevant restriction of economic use of animals, this might be the ban of battery farms, then a step to free range, and then a ban on killing, this exists in Austria for dogs and cats already, you're not allowed to kill them, if, if this is not necessary for themselves. And then you could step to the weak rights, according to Mary Mitchley, who argues that um, there should be rights unless human needs are very important, and suddenly these rights disappear. And then you could have the, the, only, the only right, one right, that is a right to have the animal welfare law enacted, which would make animals to a person, but not give them additional rights. We tried that in the trial for, for a chimp. And then um, have basic rights according to the Great Ape Project and have basic rights for all animals and eventually equal value of life and suffering and, um, and sort of uh, liberation. So that would be sort of the continuum. Okay, the next question. Okay. 
Uh, thank you. Martin, looking at your um, gravity model, I'm wondering whether it has to be legal change or any other sort of structural change. Um, for instance, in Germany, uh, we are now getting a ban on colony cages, but first we convinced all the supermarket chains not to sell the eggs anymore. And then the Minister of Agriculture ac actually said, well, these cages are not uh, economically important to us, so we can ban them. And another example might be that uh, once you have like a very vegan or veg-friendly environment that could also be some sort of structural change that moves the uh, gravity to, to the right. Yes, absolutely. I think these um, changes go hand in hand. Oh, I haven't got it here. Never mind. Um, um, a structural change can very well be um, how a supermarket approaches the issue. Because if there's removed from the shelves and there's the easy reach and cheapest option is uh, barn eggs, then uh, this is a structural change because everybody will buy the barn eggs. They, they start, don't start looking around in little special shops where you get battery eggs. So um, I do think that's very important. We also do a lot um, um, sort of combined thing with the supermarkets. I think it was important when we got a ban on the battery cages in Austria that we had the supermarkets in our case afterwards, but they had to get the supermarkets as well. If the supermarkets were sticking to the cages, the battery cage eggs, then the, the ban would have been lifted because the government would have said we don't destroy our own economy, definitely. So it was for us vital to achieve the, the, an agreement amongst the supermarkets. And it wasn't easy because we have this Hofer chain, which in German is called Aldi, and this chain was just only selling cage eggs. And they were not reacting to anything. So we did things like... Um, the trolley campaign. We went in, filled up a trolley, and then left a piece of paper saying, oh, I saw you only sell battery cage eggs, so I don't buy this stuff. And we did that across the country. And also, um, we did an action day with 50 demos at, one, at once, at the same time, and um, in, in front of 50 different such supermarkets, until they met with me, grudgingly. <laughs> then I sat with them, and then this is the usual thing, about half an hour they shout at you, what an awful bastard you are. <laughs> This is oh, oh, good news already. You sit there and smiling and say, you know, you know. And when that happen, has happened, then they start giving you an option so, and saying, compromise this. And then we say, yes. So um, they, they left also this, this battery cage thing. And had it not achieved, been achieved like that, then it, it wouldn't have worked. So I mean, <clears throat> the statistics with doing these kind of campaigns is so small because every campaign is so long and the life of a human is so short. So I have 12, 12 um, examples of experience, 12 campaigns in one country at reasonably the same sort of um, area time. And this is not enough experience to say how it has to be, you know. And as, as, as Claudio said, I mean, these tactics don't work forever. Next thing, they are much better organized, so you have to have a different tactic. So this can only be, this is my experience, learn from it or try it in your country, in your situation and see what works best there. So I would be very tolerant with, with uh, approaches. But definitely supermarkets are a vital, vital point in, in changing the system. Okay, next question. Uh, last point of this continuum hypothesis was, uh, if you can show it, please. <laughs> Uh, equal value of life and suffering uh, of animals and humans, right? Yeah. Uh, have you have you ever thought about uh, animals uh, killed in road accidents and how is it? Because I've got more and more thoughts about uh, how demoralizing it is for people um, seeing all those corpses on the roads all the time, like hedgehogs, uh, cats, with you know, some small animals, some bigger animals sometimes. And um, it seems that there are no laws and um, no control. It, it would be very hard to um, control it or, or uh, you know, to, to, to uh, introduce any, any laws, and penalties. Uh, have you ever had any thoughts on this subject? I mean, it's hard to sort of be up there and then jump down there for a solution in reality. I mean, obviously, when, when, the, when the attitude to animals change and their political value increases, they might have um, spokespersons for them within politics. They might be able to sue drivers 
because they become persons and can actually have a legal guardian who, who lets the, the cars be sued if they are driven over or being hurt. So there's lots of things that might happen in between. Um, some people tell me, maybe this is part of what you're saying, not that it's your opinion, but um, tell me that this is totally absurd exactly for that reason, because you can't sort of uh, value the, the driving over a toad like driving over a human. But um, this has, I'm sure, lots to do with the size of the animals. I mean, if humans were so small and whirling around everywhere, maybe we would drive them over equally often. I don't know. It might be a macroscopic, microscopic question. Um, <clears throat> especially, say, if there were humans who don't speak our language, or if they were humans Neanderthals. Like, I mean, you would say this is a genus homo, but they don't articulate, so I'm sure you would drive them over like... Um, okay, but anyway, yeah, this, uh, there are a lot of new problems that arise, like there are rabbits living on this place, and there is a building society wants to put a house there. Who wins? Yeah? Can you not build any more houses for humans just because some rabbits sitting there? Yeah, I mean, there must be then a weighing of interest. There must be some legal representative of the rabbit saying, we want to live there, we have lived here before, and then see how it happens. I mean, nobody, nobody knows how this could work out in practice, and maybe it's just not possible. But I can only say, let's try, let's go down that road and see how far we go. I mean, I won't um, live to see this, but I mean, hope some might, and then we'll see what happens. Okay, next question. Okay, I, I might have one. <laughs> Please wait. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, because actually I remember that uh, in the late 90s, um, demonstrations, occupations were very popular in Poland. Then uh, we were learning year after year that uh, demonstrations are actually something ridiculous to politicians and that uh, this kind of campaigns uh, just doesn't go any good for animals. So I was wondering how you are actually constructing your campaigns that your demonstrations, your occupations, are treated seriously uh, by politicians? Um, I have a very good example just from the day before yesterday. <laughs> We did, uh, we did, we have this, this, also not this, we have this um, hunting campaign against um, releasing birds for, for shooting. And we stood outside this, um, the, the government, the provincial government, like we do every week, and protested there. And there uh, comes the, the, the politician responsible for this in government out and says, I don't like this, uh, this, this banner, can't we do something about it? Then the head of the conservative party, um, who, who he is a member of, came out and said, can't we find the time where we can meet? And then the head of the Greens, who is in the coalition government, came out and bought us ice cream, vegan, for 40 euro. And these are all measures to get us away from there. They don't like us being there. The ideal for them would be that you write a letter and say, please do. And then they throw it away and then write back to you, I will consider. Um, so standing there is astonishingly, astonishingly effective. They hate nothing more than people who are making permanently, yeah, always there and making the public all the time aware of them. Um, we have also the demos outside the palaces of those people who actually own these enclosures. This guy also came out and tried to belittle people and he has o o apparently security who is following people and so he, he, he prided himself of knowing the names of many of the participants. He would never do that yeah, if they, he wouldn't bother about these demos. I can say it's this small tiny little five to ten people demos if they're often enough outside these places just grind them down. This is an experience that, that we have, in addition to, to other actions as well. But this is as a backbone of the, of the campaign. It is astonishingly effective, and it still is, after 20 years. And do you think it's helpful to have someone like you, who is a, um, like a man in his late 30s, well-educated, representing, who can... I'm talk to politicians. <laughs> no, it's a little bit. It's a little bit sexist, but uh, it's a little bit sexist. But what uh, I've noticed in Polish politicians, well, they're not very smart. But uh, so they usually want to talk to people similar to them, and they unfortunately usually are uh, white men uh, in their 40s or 50s. And I was wondering if having a you know like a leader who could represent what they think is okay helps you. <laughs> um, I'm probably 
really bad for this because I don't suit to this. Because I don't wear a suit and tie and I just can't. I get allergic reactions. <laughs> if you ask Mahi, he will say this is vital and I can say I try it and I just can't. <laughs> I hate it so much. I'm really sorry. And, and if I was wearing suit and tie and probably having a Rolex watch, they might be listening to me more. This might be the case, yeah. But I just can't. But I'm honest. I'm getting there and I'm saying this is how it is. And I'm a scientist who can present the scientific facts. And I'm also not alone there. When I do this negotiation, I have um, scientists with me. In that case, I had four um, expert statements. And the four experts were with me, with negotiating. And um, yes, it is definitely so that because I don't have suit and tie and I don't look like one of their ilk, um, they, will, they will not yeah, we will not take me as seriously. But then um, the pressure and the, the honesty that, like, if, if, if I say we stuck into this and we're not going away, then they know that I mean that. And um, that, that may, might compensate some ties. But uh, in reality, it, it might play a role. And if some people will tell you it plays a big role. But um, it is not necessary, because otherwise I would never win a campaign. Thanks. Okay, any more questions? Okay, so, f okay, one more. Just, just a couple of points from a UK perspective um, in that to support what you said regarding um, not liking the, the, the politician not liking you in their face. Parliament Square is now banned for protest. Uh, it's traditionally in the UK, people have protested outside Parliament. That has now been cleared as a space. If anyone tries to stand there, they will be arrested on the spot. Uh, and this is the so-called liberal United Kingdom uh, we're talking about here. Um, and, and also, I mean, it, it may vary depending on your political action, your political system. For example, on your slide regarding political change, getting legislation and getting enforcement. In the UK, we also have to keep an eye on the legislation being reversed. The, the Hunting Act is the most famous uh, example of that. That Hunting Act took us 20, 30 years plus to get into place. It is constantly under threat. It is constantly under attack and can be legislated against at any moment, uh, depending on reversal of the, the political factor. Now, that might be our first past the post system and we have two opposing big parties and one can come in sweep into power quite quickly. Um, maybe uh, in a system where you have post representation, that's, that's not as difficult or not as a problem. But certainly I agree with your uh, assessment about um, being politically active and they hate it and they even banned it in the UK now. If you step if you step foot on Parliament Green and try to protest, the police will shift you very quickly. Um, but also in our system you have to monitor the legislation can it's always under always under threat of reversal. Yeah, I mean, you don't need to protest only outside Parliament. There are lots of other places, luckily, there's headquarters of the parties, there's where the people live. <laughs> and um, so, uh, but I, I understand that in the UK there's lots of repression going on, and what I what I feel was missing there. I I, I was in the UK for eight years in the 90s, and I, uh, what I feel is from the 80s to the 90s and active, and what I was missing from my view now, looking back, not realizing it then, a cooperation of the grassroots with the nationals, a combined force where they actually support each other. The one putting pressure on the streets, and the others giving them the public sympathy and making the serious political argument. And the combination of them is, I feel, what made these, um, these successes possible. So this is what I sort of strongly advise, if I can, or um, should suggest, that you not infight, that you just support each other. And even if not in public, then privately. You tell them the news, and they tell you the news, and they negotiate, and you protest and scream, and they say, you know, they scream, give us something, then they will stop. Like, this, this it does work. And the worst is if you fight each other. And yeah, and this is sort of what I got up was, was the problem in, in England. Um, just one word, if I can. This is um, an action that we want to do in Vienna on the 5th of November. The idea came from um, 
uh, Igualdad Animal. This is Madrid with 400 participants. We want to be 500. So um, I ask if you want to join us and help us. As this is a vigil of one hour in the city center of Vienna. Um, on the 5th of November in this year. And on this website, which is not very conducible for English speakers, um, is um, you can register and get an English information and, um, <clears throat> and can register so that we know who is coming and where from. They are real, they, they are real dead animals, yes. Um, yeah, from the rubbish bins of factory farms uh, or the rubbish bins of the, the producers of hunting areas. Need to, also those, those pheasantries, there's lots of dead animals. Every day there's animals dying there. If you go there, you can take them out of the bin. The pig factories, the broilers, the hen, um, laying hen farms, everywhere, everywhere the animals are dying, 10% per, per season. And so you can get loads and loads of dead animals from there. Okay, so let's say thank you to Martin. <laughs>